Um, so now that we've gone over like the theoretical uh, aspects of like these different technologies, um, you know uh, the different things that came before. How do we actually use this stuff? And so one of the things that I think people don't cover enough is uh, not how do you get started with GraphQL from scratch, but how do you actually use it uh, in your job? And uh, you know I don't have to explain to you all of the benefits of GraphQL. It basically makes everyone's life better. Client developers, server developers. There's more flexibility. You can get the data you want. You can expose a really nice, uniform API. Um, you know, it's even more efficient. So why would people not use that technology, right? Why isn't everybody in this room right now, and there's like a million of us uh, in this presentation? <laughs> so what are the questions people first ask when they discover GraphQL? Um, they ask, where do I start? Um, they ask, can I use this at work? Do I have to rewrite all of my stuff? Because it's such a big change. It's such a different technology. Um, and how do I get it running in production at the end of the day, right? I know how to implement a basic prototype. I know how to get it going. I can sign up for the GraphQL console. Um, what if I want to use it on top of my uh, enterprise OData SOAP stack, right? Because um, that's something people have to do in their daily life, like, every day. And side note, um, you know, Jonas presented about this in detail, but I think uh, it's very important to consider that sometimes GraphQL is presented a little bit as too much of a mental shift, I think, for people to be able to easily get into it. Right? Uh, people talk about how you have to adopt a totally different way of thinking. You have to think in graphs now. You can't ever think about endpoints. Um, but in reality, as we heard, GraphQL is really just a standardization of things people have been doing for decades. Right? Uh, you know, people have been adding endpoints to the REST API for a while uh, to expand stuff, to filter things. Um, and the best part about GraphQL is there's nothing particularly new about it. It's just a way of doing that that everyone can collaborate on and build unified tools for. So really, the golden ticket for any technology to become really popular is incremental adoption. Right? So you guys, I think, have all heard of React here. And I think one of the biggest reasons that React was successful is that you could get started with it super easily uh, without worrying about like, rewriting your whole app or changing anything significant. You could take exactly one component in your app. You could rewrite it in React, um, import it, and you could feel really good right away and deploy it to production. And I believe that GraphQL can be done the exact same way. So uh, you know. <laughs> just a really simple diagram of what your existing app might look like. You might have some different data sources. Uh, you might have a web app. You might have a mobile app. Uh, actually, I ripped off this diagram from a talk Danielle gave about how we migrated our own internal app to GraphQL, uh, which had some other data systems in it before. And it's very simple. You can just take that GraphQL server. You can put it inside your existing API. You can put it next to the existing API. Um, you can load data either from your existing API gateway or from your backend. And then you can load up a client, and you can put data in just one component at a time. And uh, it totally works, and there's no problem with doing it that way. And uh, I think there should be more stories told about how you guys might have done that in your own apps. So you know, getting the easy stuff out of the way first, you know, on the client, like with React, it's very easy to adopt GraphQL incrementally. If you have a GraphQL API lying around, loading that data in is just as simple as doing an HTTP request the same way you did it before. Right? So with the REST API, you can just hit that URL, throw that data into Redux, local state, you know, whatever you want to put it into, a variable. Um, you can just replace that HTTP request with a GraphQL request, and it will work exactly the same way. You don't have to change anything about what you're doing. Uh, if you want fancier features, you can do even better. You can use a GraphQL client that has some caching features, some pagination. Um, we've, in particular, worked really hard, especially because of this, to make Apollo client super easy to incrementally adopt. And we've heard about people converting their apps using jQuery and Backbone uh, to React and Apollo and having their Backbone models talk to their GraphQL data. Um, and I think that's super awesome because how else are you supposed to get out of a Backbone and jQuery app um, if you don't have a tool that you can use side by side with that? Um, and for some people, actually, GraphQL is a great way to, while you're thinking about using some of these more modern UI technologies, to revamp your data layer at the same time so you can start thinking in a more componentized way, make everything you're doing more modular uh, and modern. So how do you incrementally adopt an API? Well, uh, one of the greatest things, like Jonas said earlier, is the resolvers. Is uh, there's nothing about GraphQL that makes it tied to a particular backend or database or storage system. Um, you can model virtually any kind of application data. There are some things that people have trouble with, like CMSs with fully dynamic fields, but almost any regular application, you can model that as a GraphQL schema. In fact, in your UI code, you probably already expect some fields to be there, and that's kind of like the de facto schema of your API. You maybe just haven't written it down yet. Um, and you can start with the client-side needs. Um, you can think about one component in your UI, think about what query you might want to run to get the data for that component, and then implement just that part of the schema. 
Um, the other really cool thing about GraphQL that makes it great to incrementally adopt is it works really well as an API gateway. So rather than something you have to put directly on top of a database, you can put it on top of your existing REST API or public API and get going right away. Um, and uh, you know, just one suggestion for incrementally adopting an API is uh, don't build it into your native app and then push it to the App Store if you're not really sure. So if you want to experiment with GraphQL, probably the best place to start is uh, with something like JavaScript, like a web app or a React Native app that you can easily replace if you decide you want to switch to OData, for example. Um, so, you know, there, thanks. there are two ways to present GraphQL, and I think we see the first one a lot more because people like to give talks introducing people at meetups uh, to how they might get started with this exciting new technology. So people often talk about greenfield apps. Um, you know, you take a tutorial, you create a new node app from scratch, you put it on top of a Mongo database or whatever. Um, but the brownfield case is even more exciting. Uh, if you have an existing app with an existing backend, uh, it actually addresses critical problems for you. It's not just a nice to have thing for your API. The thing that makes it hard to build tutorials for that or introduce people to that is that every situation is different. Everyone has a different backend, a different front end, different preferences for their architecture, caching, use cases, whatever. Um, but I think that makes it actually much more interesting. And the real problem, and I've, I've heard this from almost everybody I've talked to, is that uh, there's not enough guidance about how you might implement GraphQL in production today. Because there's all these great tutorials for getting started, um, but people kind of have to figure it out on their own um, as they get further into that process. You know, once you get a first taste of GraphQL through your prototype Hello World app, uh, you really want it at work uh, to, so that you don't have to worry about like, reading documentation anymore or like, doing multiple requests to get data. So I think the approach that we're taking to this right now with this tool we launched very recently is can we cut this problem into very small pieces? Um, instead of teaching people how to like, convert a certain set of technologies, can we teach people a little bit at a time? And that's exactly why we built this tool that Jonas was just talking about, uh, which is called Apollo Launchpad. And uh, if you guys haven't seen this yet, um, it's like a JS fiddle for GraphQL servers. So you go to this website, you can uh, get a quick GraphQL schema in there. It's actually deployed to the cloud. You can hit run, you can save it, and uh, you can share examples with people of how to do different patterns, like pagination, for example. And uh, we have a repository uh, called Awesome Launchpad that we created. This tool just came out on Thursday. And there's already some great examples about how to do mocking with GraphQL, how to load data from MongoDB, how to load data from Neo4j, actually contributed by Neo4j people who are right here at the conference. Um, and I invite you to come go there and share your own patterns, how to use data loader, how to do pagination, how to do authorization authentication, because these are the kinds of things there's not enough of in the community. Uh, so <laughs> I invite you to join me, and together we can grow the GraphQL community. I don't, I don't know what it said before. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so let's say we've uh, built a prototype, we've learned about some patterns for GraphQL servers. What are the things we need to worry about for production? Because the next question people ask is, uh, okay, so I really like it. How do I convince everyone else in my company that our stuff is not going to crash and burn the second we put this into production. Um, well, it clearly isn't because there are lots of huge companies using GraphQL for their primary data loading. Um, but you sometimes have to convince everyone a little bit at a time. So I think this is a bit of a checklist that I came up with for um, what you might want to do to reassure yourself that putting GraphQL in production is going to work for you. I think the number one thing uh, all the time when you're thinking about production or optimization or anything like that is to get the data. Right? Don't worry about optimizing stuff ahead of time, checking stuff. Just go put the instrumentation in there, figure out what's going on, and test it out. Um, then, once you find the problems, you need to know the tools you have available to make those improvements. And then you also need to make sure that people who are uh, getting access by that API, the backend services, people who are on the databases, are not having any negative aspects from you running this new API. So for instrumentation, what do you need for GraphQL? Um, I think the biggest thing you need is you need to make sure you have instrumentation that can understand GraphQL. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, there's a product that we build called Optics. There's um, the GraphQL Pro package for Ruby, uh, maintained by the author of that package who recently joined GitHub. Um, but the most important thing, even if you do it yourself, is that you can identify what queries are being run, what fields are being accessed, how long those are taking. Because if the only thing you get is you get something that says your slash GraphQL endpoint was accessed and it took like 300 milliseconds, that's not enough information to build on to figure out how you're going to fix any problems that come up. And the last thing is you can actually write your client code and your queries in a way that lets you more easily identify what is going on in the server. And that's one of the reasons we're super excited about this new approach that everyone's taking, especially with really modern recently coming out, of always doing uh, static queries. So 
You want to make sure that the code you write on the client, you have great names for your queries, great names for your fragments, so that when you go on the server and you see what's going on, you actually know where that code came from on the client. It's not just like a random query with a bunch of fields in it. Um, because that's the only way you're going to be able to go identify that query and improve it later. So I think there are really two kinds of problems that you can run into uh, with an API like GraphQL. Either your front end is too slow, and you want to make it faster, you want to make your app load more quickly, or your back end is receiving too much load. Um, you're having trouble, you have too much CPU usage, memory usage, something like that. And actually, the funny thing about these two things is that they're often at odds. Uh, you might want to pay more for your server so it can handle more requests faster to make your UI load quicker, or you might be okay with your UI loading slower if you can save money on the server. Uh, the easiest place to start is always with client-side improvements. So uh, the thing that I'm most excited about, and I'm, I'm a front-end developer, so I'm, I don't actually know anything about APIs, but um, <laughs> the thing that I'm most excited about with GraphQL is that it gives so much power to the front-end developer to control their own destiny. Uh, you no longer have to say, I called an endpoint and it was slow and there's nothing I can do about that. Because sometimes you can actually just look at the query and if you have the right instrumentation to understand what's going on, you can say, well, okay, I'm, I'm actually trying to display for some reason the weather uh, on this person's profile, but that hits an external API and I actually don't really even need that data. Why are we even showing that? And now you have the power to just remove that field and make your query faster without even changing the API at all. Uh, you can also do a lot of stuff with great tools to do client-side caching. You can use an offline cache to cache data that doesn't change very often. Um, you can use tools to locate different data in the cache even if it doesn't match the query. Um, but if those things don't work, you are going to have to go and actually improve your GraphQL server, which is also not that hard. So um, you know, the biggest question people have after they go through all the questions that we just went through is, how do I make my server perform well for GraphQL? Right? I know that it's great for clients. I know that it lets me build stuff really quickly. But um, how do I make sure that it doesn't crash and burn? Um, so I think, uh, like we said before, basically you want to balance this question of uh, kind of latency versus server load. So uh, one question that comes up when people come from REST is, in REST, you hand code every single endpoint uh, most of the time, unless you have something that's code generating it. Um, and you might feel that there might be some overhead coming from actually traversing all these different fields in the query, calling all these functions. But it turns out there's actually not that much overhead. And uh, it's very easy to justify it. I think it's something like um, uh, there was a talk recently by the developer of Facebook's GraphQL server at our San Francisco meetup who said it's something on the order of only 10% overhead of the CPU on their server. And in my mind, that's extremely more than worth all the developer productivity you get from having that API compared to having to hard code all of your endpoints. Um, and the thing that helped us a lot, actually, in production was making sure that we were caching all the parsing and validation of those queries. So by the time the request comes in, you just retrieve from memory the query that's parsed and validated, and then from that point you just run a couple of functions and you return the result. Um, and like Jonas said, one of the greatest things about GraphQL is that it's very similar to previous APIs and that it totally can be stateless, so you can just add more servers when you need to scale it up. Um, and one other cool trick is you can actually use custom scalers to break out of GraphQL at will when you need to. You can have a custom scalar field in your schema that's a JSON blob if you don't want to worry about writing resolvers for that part of your data. Or one thing we actually did in our application is we had a field that uh, needed to return a chart with thousands of items in it. And it was way more efficient for us to encode that in a binary format that just had those numbers in a row. And we could use, and easily use a custom scaler for that and parse that on the client and not worry about returning JSON fields for all that stuff. So GraphQL even is very flexible about moving in and out of that schema model whenever you need to. Um, so what do we do about backend API usage? Right. So um, one of the questions people always have is, you know, you can send this one query that accesses all this junk from the back end all at the same time. But in reality, a lot of people are already doing that. Um, sometimes you have a view in your mobile app that has to request several different endpoints just to fulfill all the stuff it needs. And really, in the ideal case for GraphQL, actually, sub-ideal, you can do even better than that, but in a pretty good case for GraphQL, you just do the same number of requests you did from your client, but now you're doing them on the back end. Um, so it's not any actual more load on your back ends than you had before, you're just doing them much faster because the round trips from the server are much faster than the round trips from like a mobile app. But still, there are a lot of tools we can use to reduce those fetches. So the biggest uh, theme in reducing the load on your backend when you're using GraphQL is to leverage the features of your backend when you can. Right? So if your backend is a key value store where the only thing you can do is put an ID and get back a blob, there's not too much you can do. You just have to retrieve those objects. But if you're using something like SQL or using Mongo, uh, or using Elasticsearch, something that can actually have a fancy query that lets you retrieve a, a big subset of data at the same time, 
you should be using a tool like Data Loader that lets you collect those requirements up front and send those in one query because your database is going to be faster at handling that than your uh, application layer in GraphQL. Um, and you should always make sure to be nice to your backend, <laughs> backend team there. Make sure you're not sending them like 10,000 requests in parallel. Make sure that either you have some back pressure set up to make sure that your server can tell you when it's being overwhelmed, or set up manually some rate limiting to make sure that it's not calling it too much. And the best part is, in theory, GraphQL should be able to be way more efficient than any kind of REST API because you have so much more information about the data you actually need at the time to fulfill that view uh, that in the limit, in the next years, I imagine we can make it so that we're always doing exactly the right amount of work to get exactly the data that we need, which is something you wouldn't have been able to do if you didn't have this language to specify what you want. So, super trendy right now. Um, you know, at, at React Europe uh, two days ago, Lee Byron released Relay Modern, uh, Relay 1.0. And one of the headline features there are persisted queries. Um, and uh, the idea there is that instead of sending the query to the server, you actually save all your queries to the database and you send an ID for a query instead. And it's great that actually all of the popular GraphQL clients, including Apollo Client, Relay Modern, they all now support that feature, um, which is really great because that's exactly how Facebook has been doing that in production for many years with their native mobile clients. But um, I thought this was interesting uh, because this is something that a lot of people are really excited about in terms of performance. But to me, what comes to mind is this idea of making sure you measure what you're trying to optimize. Because there are a lot of different things you can do with queries in GraphQL to make them more efficient, less efficient, easier to develop, harder to develop. And actually, this concept that people blanket refer to as persisted queries consists of at least four different things that you might be doing with your queries that would make them more efficient. The first is make sure you're not doing any runtime modification of your queries. Uh, you actually send the query pretty much as you wrote it to the server. And that's important even, as I mentioned, just for good instrumentation, which is like secretly the only reason we were pushing static queries six months ago is so we could make our instrumentation product better. But it's good that everyone else came around to that as well. <laughs> um, also, another thing you might want to do is make sure your server only accepts uh, the queries that you wrote and not queries that somebody else wrote, um, which you could call whitelisting as a separate concept. Persisted queries in this breakdown boils down specifically to the idea of sending only the ID over the wire rather than sending the entire query string. And the main benefit there, if you break it down, is saving bandwidth from your mobile app to your server. So you might want to measure and decide if that's something that's very important to you or if the bandwidth you're sending is actually OK, and then you don't have to worry about maintaining this database of queries because that's the main benefit you're going to get from that. And then the last thing that's really cool and really modern is the idea of having a query compiler, um, which does some uh, optimizations to your queries, like eliminating some redundant fields that you might have in fragments. Um, so that's pretty interesting. I'll, I think it'll be really interesting to see uh, how far the query compilation stuff can go and if, if that can create really significant optimizations. Um, but in particular, the one thing that people often go to when they're talking about persistent queries is preventing malicious queries from clients that you don't want to support, right? And if you have a public API, there's not really that much you can do about this uh, in terms of like, you know, people are going to be sending arbitrary queries to your server if you have a public API. So you need a way of handling it that doesn't require people to save all their queries on your server ahead of time. But fortunately, it's not actually that hard. So simplest thing you should always have on like every API is basic rate limiting. So a client can send you a bunch of requests really quickly. So you, you should <laughs> probably have that for your REST API as well. Um, a little bit more advanced thing you can do um, that I think is actually really easy to do in Sangria, because Oleg is like super boss, um, is to calculate costs for your queries statically. So you can look at the query and be like, this query is like too complicated, so I'm just going to not resolve it at all. I'm not even going to call my backends ever. I'm just going to fail it basically like a validation error. And if you want to get really advanced, and this is something that I think Facebook actually does alongside uh, persisting those queries, is track the cost over time. So a small query costs a little bit. A big query costs a lot. And for a particular user, a particular client of your app, you want to give them uh, maybe a, an allowance of how much data they're allowed to fetch you from your server. So either they can send a lot of small queries or several big queries, but they can't download your entire database in one go. And fortunately, this is something that might not be too hard to implement once you have the query costing stuff available. And then I think whitelisting can still be useful, but in my mind, it's only for extreme cases because um, you don't have the time to look at your entire UI, look at every single query in that, and before deploying, uh, go over them with a highlighter to make sure that every field is legit. You probably just want to deploy that to staging or to production or to some number of users and check if it's doing anything bad. Um, so I think this is definitely something that everyone should be thinking about who is trying to run GraphQL in production.
And then uh, just as the last thing I wanted to leave you guys with is um, there are like a lot more things you can do with performance in GraphQL that people aren't actually doing yet. Um, and I'm really excited to get into some of those things and explore them, possibly with tools like Launchpad. Um, could we get the exact same performance with GraphQL as you would get with a handcrafted REST endpoint built for that particular UI uh, that you're trying to serve to? And I think the answer is you actually can, because really what you're doing with the GraphQL query is you're kind of like just creating a new endpoint for that particular client, for that particular view. And there's no reason you couldn't optimize that endpoint, that particular query, or even the sub part of that query, the same way you would hand optimize the queries that are done for the REST API. Um, so one of the things I want everyone to think about, uh, if you're into this kind of stuff, is to see if you could uh, look ahead in your queries from a particular resolver, look at the selection set, look at the selection set, selection set, and see if you can match that against a set of fragments that you know how to resolve really efficiently, and then write a particular query for that that will target a particularly expensive view in your app. I think that's, uh, that's one interesting concept that I've been, I've been thinking about and exploring with some of my, some of my colleagues. Um, and of course, another thing that um, some people are doing for uh, specifically APIs that have a lot of public data, like maybe the front page of a newspaper or something like that, is uh, caching the entire query result at once, so you never even call any resolvers. But my point here is mostly, uh, I think, you know, five years from now or something, or probably like one year from now, because like everything in GraphQL is like time compressed, so it's probably going to be tomorrow, uh, you'll be able to have exactly the same performance as you have with a super hand-coded, like, super database admin, like, SQL query REST API endpoint, but you'll be able to have it without any loss of generality of the data you can fetch from your API. I think that will be extra exciting because then nobody will ever have to build another API technology ever again, which would be great. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so the conclusions are you can definitely incrementally adopt GraphQL, as probably many of you have seen because you guys are running into production. Um, you should definitely instrument everything you're doing, regardless of how you do that, so you don't optimize stuff ahead of time before you actually need it because that saves your developers time to not do that stuff. Um, you should definitely work with your backend developers to make sure that they really enjoy having a GraphQL API on top of their uh, backend, because I think it's really nice for the front-end developers to manage the GraphQL API um, so that they can get exactly the data they need, but you need to work with the people who, who own those backends so that they love that you're doing that for them. And then um, the last thing is that even though the normal thing is usually fine, you just write a couple of resolvers and you get your data and you're all well and good, there are a ton of tools to optimize your GraphQL API to make it something that you totally don't need to worry about scaling. Um, and uh, the really call to action here, because everyone here is mostly already using GraphQL, um, is help other people do this stuff. I know I, I've talked to a lot of you, and you guys have all these secret plans. People like only talk about them when they get a conference talk slot. But you should talk about it all the time. Um, whenever you come up with some cool thing that you came up with to optimize your GraphQL API, Write a blog post about it, tweet about it, post it on, on GitHub or like a code sample. Uh, and if you, if you have some idea like that, if you have something that you think the GraphQL community could benefit from, please like tweet at me or email me or anyone on our team, and we would love to help you bring that to the world and publicize it and tell people about it. Because I think that's the way that GraphQL is going to grow the fastest and move into the future. So thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to